and let's see. All right, so welcome uh, to, I think, oh my God, this is now the 16th uh, Foresight Sanity Preserver uh, and all of that in the span of like a little, uh, just, just one week really. Um, I just uh, created a poll which I launched. Um, so I would love if you could fill that out uh, so that I have like a little bit of an understanding of uh, whose first time it is and so on, where you're located and, and how you're feeling. Uh, and I'm seeing one person fill it out. So let's review the poll later. Uh, and let's kind of get going. I'm going to share a little bit more about those salons uh, in the chat. So uh, I don't have to repeat everything, but this is just in case you're interested in joining a future salon. My name is Alison Dutman. I am a researcher currently at Foresight and the incoming president. I am so thrilled to have uh, Dean here today. Um, and yeah, Dean, I think uh, has been like in the in Foresight's community for, uh, for, for much longer than I have really. Um, and um, has been working on a few fantastic projects. And now he's been working with uh, Mark uh, together uh, on Agoric, which is a kind of market-based uh, computation. And it's like an, a really fantastic um, startup that they launched finally, I think a few years ago, um, that is kind of like pulling together much of the research that they've been working on for quite, a t for quite some time and uh, to kind of like put it out there in the world and to build like a kind of like re the ecosystem uh, in which smart contracts can operate. And uh, so it's kind of like one meta level uh, up and at least in, in my uh, lay person's understanding, but uh, I'm super, super thrilled to hear much more about this. Um, and yeah, Dina is, I think, um, um, a very, very, very energetic speaker and he could <laughs> probably speak about a ton of things. So I encourage you in the, in the Q and A to, uh, to, to really go out there. But I think in terms of uh, both topic and expertise. I'm super thrilled that you found time today uh, and I can't hear, I can't, I can't wait on kind of like the universe of smart contracts that you're going to lay out to us. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to post uh, a little bit more info on Agoric and, uh, and on you in the chat, but uh, I want to hand it over to you now to talk for a little bit before uh, we give it up for a Q&A. Welcome. I'm really, really, really glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dean Tribble, and as as uh, both Mark and Allison said, I've been I'm a Foresight Senior Associate, yeah, occasionally paying my dues, um, since the 80s, um, where uh, many of the kinds of ideas that we're talking about here, many of the ideas of hypertext, were argued about in the back room at the Foresight Institute when it was uh, uh, in, in Los Altos. So um, I do have a couple of slides, uh, because some people like reading better than others. Um, so I will go ahead and share some slides and turn off my video because I was astonished to find out that my uplink bandwidth is terrible. Um, and so this way you will get more of my voice and less of my waving hand. So I will now sit on my hands and see if I can still keep talking. Um, so uh, Agoric was a company that was founded uh, just a couple of years ago by pioneers in the space of smart contracts, where, as Markham said, we've been doing this for years. I worked on the first production smart contract uh, in 1989. And I could go very deep and very long, but I'm just going to spend 10 minutes or something, right, or 15 minutes here, introducing what we mean by that. Because one of the things we found is people don't mean the same things and, the, and, and it's all very vague and they don't necessarily appreciate what's new and unique and valuable both about smart contracts and about blockchain. Um, so I will click a button here and see if I can make it go forward. Yeah, I said some of that. We've got a great background. I could go into details, but you don't need to know that. Okay, so actually, but before I go on, how many people here, let me see if I can go into gallery view and actually see faces. Um, you know, just if, if you've got your camera up, you know, wave your hand if you've actually interacted with a smart contract. <laughs> I see a few people, I see three, four. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. So about half people so far. What we mean by a smart contract, and this is when I say we, this is, you know, evolved out of Amex, evolved out of a bunch of ideas that were in the space. Um, at one point, uh, um, uh, you know, we worked in, in the Foresight back room with uh, Nick Zabo, who coined the term smart contract after we had already built a couple, that sort of thing. And what we've always meant by it is a contract-like arrangement between multiple parties expressed in code where the behavior of the code enforces the terms of the contract. Now, an important element about this is back in 1989, there were no blockchains, right? This is all an idea that's pre-blockchain. This is, this is about the arrangement between parties and how they interact with computers, not the particular technology. And um, what our 
Um, oh, my, my window's in the way here. All right. And, 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 and so for example, eBay is a, is a smart contract where a buyer has an item, a seller's going to buy it. They're both third parties to the organization and eBay is acting as a trusted third party. eBay, Venmo, PayPal, Uber, Lyft, much of Amazon, right? There are, there's upwards of a trillion dollars in market cap. Well, you know, less in the last few weeks, um, but, but upwards of a trillion dollars in market cap expressed as and implemented as smart contracts. And the key ingredient here is that the business that's functioning, the service is operating a smart contract be, to enable new kind of cooperation between third parties. So it's not employees of eBay that are selling you something. It's, it's, it's the eBay infrastructure is deploying software that is orchestrating that collaboration between potentially total strangers to accomplish a new kind of cooperation. And much of our mission and the thing that has driven us over the last literally three decades to pursue this kind of vision is exactly that ability to enable new forms of cooperation. And so again, upwards of a trillion dollars predates blockchain, right? Blockchain didn't have anything to do with smart contracts, but they do bring something to the table. And so what we're able to do now is new because of that technology. So let me talk about what's important about blockchain from the point of view of, you know, cutting through all the hype, right? So the gold standard of what we mean by a blockchain is it is multiple independent computers in different jurisdictions and in different administrative zones. So there isn't a single point of, shall we say administrative compromise, but in multiple independent computers voting to agree on data. You know, did I write a check to Allison? <laughs> um, the order of events, did I write that check to Allison before I wrote the very same check to Markham? <laughs> or before I issued something to withdraw money from my account, and the results of computation, right? The result of do, running some software to say, okay, that person bid the most, so I'm awarding them the asset. I will issue the automatic order to the delivery system to send the package to them, right? And so that computation is in a blockchain case, is not executed by one computer, which could be compromised by one person with access to one data center, but is instead the result of multiple computers in different countries under different legal regimes with no single point of administrative ownership of the data centers that could go in and stick in a virus or slide in a transaction before the close of business or whatever it is, that no one is in a position to compromise their execution. And by having a hundred computers or a thousand computers or even seven computers, separately execute the same program and vote on did the results come out the same way gives you an entirely new level of integrity of execution. So now, instead of relying on eBay or Venmo or Lyft or Uber or whatever, in order to determine what, in order to, in order to instead of having to trust them to execute a program correctly, I can simply know that, you know, get a review, look at the program, get the ratings and inspection of it and execute the program in an environment where no party can compromise, where there's no one that is able to go in. And as I said, slip in that, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know how many people here remember Enron where they were sliding, they had a software thing that was allocating, um, uh, uh, you know, that was doing sales of electricity capacity. And in the back room, they were slipping in transactions just before the close of the day, or rather slipping in transactions the next day dated for the previous day and doing various other kinds of shenanigans on the execution of the software that allowed them to, to, to steal money and defraud uh, their customers. Being able to run high integrity computation enables these new kinds of cooperation where now buyers and sellers can directly cooperate even though they don't know each other at all because the software is is implementing that arrangement in a way that neither side can compromise it. Okay, so um, before I go on, any sort of questions about that high level set of ideas? Because then I'll dive into technology. I have one question. And this is perhaps a little bit um, out of scope for this 
Sure. For a discussion, but it is curious, uh, and I don't quite understand, which is from a user's perspective, why should one necessarily trust the blockchain more than one trusts eBay? And what I mean by that is from a sort of naive user, one can still imagine that there's some coordinated denial of service or coordinated attack to corrupt the blockchain. It's just harder, right? Um, right. And so, so there are a couple of elements is it's not just a little bit harder, it's way harder and you can't do it in secret. So a coordinated effort to do not denial of service. Now you've got to deny service to a vast number of potentially unknown sites that are all coordinating with each other in order to vote on each block of transactions going through. And so you can't, you know, you shut down, you know, 30 different sites, well, there's 125, so that's still a quorum, the chain moves on, right? And many of them are deployed at, you know, Amazon or Azure or behind Cloudflare or whatever it is. So they have a strong incentive to make sure that they are robust. People have tried it, it's been largely unsuccessful, but could happen. They also, that each of these different voting arrangements has ways you could compromise that where you end up with 51% of the electorate that you, that you manage to vote with, but, Again, that ends up being visible. It ends up that it, there is a indelible record in the chain of exactly who voted how and what was going on. And so it is, um, it is uh, extremely difficult to do so and it's essentially impossible to do so in private. Whereas we know that all of these, these um, single source uh, uh, individual services that are private services um, they are compromised in a wide variety of ways under contractual arrangement or, or um, you know, various governments uh, imposing uh, software on them or what have you, right? Even, you know, what was it, uh, two days ago, everyone's using Zoom. Yeah, there was just a publish where they, find, where they finally removed the place where they were reporting all of your Zoom usage data into the uh, Facebook um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, whatever the, the company, Quant, not Quantico, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the quant company that, that is doing all this, this uh, nasty analysis and, and misuse of people's data. So, so you know, and it, it, this is now the third um, embarrassing security thing in their private uh, uh, stack um, the, 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 that they've gotten caught with, right? So that's the sort of thing where, where by having code executed in a high integrity substrate, now reviews, analysis, publishing, comparisons, that sort of thing have teeth because once you've reviewed and deployed it, well, someone can't come along and, you know, slip in that nasty back door because, because that part is all linked to the integrity of, 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 of which contract people are, are participating in. So if I've got a, a contract that will do random fair distribution to, uh, of tickets in a, in a decentralized um, uh, stub hub, you know, that means that A, it's very easy to people to use it in smaller venues like my local theater or uh, movie tickets or use cases that, that stub hub did not contemplate. But it's also the case that now people aren't paying a 35% fee to stub hub in exchange for these things. And so you end up with the ability to have more lighter weight uses, more decentralization, and more of the fee structure in the middle taken out and, 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 and um, not imposed on the, uh, the buyers and sellers that are trying to coordinate to, in order to just sell a ticket. All right, I will go into some of the very high level technical stuff. Um, and you can stop me at any time, Allison. <laughs> Um, we have a, oh, we have, this is great. I'm loving it. Okay, I good. encourage people to raise their hand if they have a question. Yeah, and where do I see the hand raises? Where will that be? I see them. Okay, you'll tell me. All right, good. <laughs> In that case, I will just natter and you will, uh, you will wave at me. All right. Um, so, um, as I said, we were doing the smart contracts before blockchain, and the coordination was just cryptographic protocols between machines where, you know, my machine is sending a message to, you know, Lyft and Lyft's machine is sending a message to some other guy and the driver's machine is sending a message to Lyft and it does the, the coordination and then we arrange a ride and et cetera. What blockchains add, going back to my characterization of it's a bunch of machines voting to agree, is essentially it's new machines made out of that agreement rather than out of silicon. So Ethereum, which maybe all of you have heard of, 
is just a computer with about the performance of an old cell phone, but with this vastly higher integrity and robustness. So it's an old cell phone that is publicly accessible that nobody can compromise and nobody can shut down, right? Um, and with a cost model, so you have to pay to run things there so that no one can completely take it over, you can still get stuff through, right? And so we have protocols for being able to communicate between machines. In this picture, these stacks of, of little, you know, each little rectangle here is a machine, and these stacks are replicated, uh, re are the replications making up a blockchain. So they're all, each in each stack, they're all doing the same thing. And you can imagine messages flowing between these machines. And I'll come back to that, but that's exactly the kind of thing that Agoric built. So we have this notion of a VAT, as we call it, which is a simple, sim uh, um, a simple transactional event loop style thing where a message comes into like a web page and, I, and I've got a current state of the web page, a message comes in like I click a mouse, it computes a new state of the web page and renders that and goes and waits for the next event. So that's sort of the event loop model. In a smart contract, the message coming in is bid in the auction. The state transition is, oh, you're now the highest bidder. And the new state is the recording of the highest bidder, the recording of the highest bid, and the recording of the message that needs to go off to the bank that says, hey, transfer some money. And so each transaction is state change on the contract and messages to other contracts. And so you end up with this, with these little islands of simple synchronous programming embedded in this much larger sea of asynchronous communication where contracts are sending messages to each other. So my portfolio manager could be sending messages to the contract, could be sending messages to a stock sale contract in order to acquire some stock or something like that. Okay, now these VATs are these small isolated containers that have contracts and their state and their libraries and all of that, and this nice little simple event loop uh, state machine model of the world, um, sending asynchronous messages to each other. They may be sending it on the same machine, in this case, the Agora public chain in this example, and there may be multiple VATs on all these different chains, or they may be sending messages between these different machines. And you know, between machines, it just takes, it just means the message takes longer to travel, right? If I've got my machine here, you know, my phone here and my, and my desktop here and they're communicating, the messages take very little time. If I've got multiple processes on the same machine, they take even less. If I'm sending a message to a machine in China, it probably takes longer. It's just a matter of how long the round trips are, but conceptually, it's all the same thing happening. And so we out of this, I'll, I'll skip the protocols that we build, but there are, there are protocols that we build for interoperability with multiple chains that, 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 that are uh, applicable between each of these layers. But let me just focus on the layers right now. So above this VAT layer, above this simple model of computation, we have what we call the OCAP layer, the object capability layer. And that's a security model of which in our, in our you know, history, you can see many, many talks about how to approach uh, computer security using object capabilities. And indeed, the most secure, the are easily arguably the most secure operating system in the world, SEL4, is an OCAP model based on all of these design principles that we and especially Markham have been champions of for the last several decades. Markham is Mark Miller here, by the way. Um, uh, uh, and that's a story is why he's named that. Um, but um, so, so what we have is this model uh, you know, of object-oriented programming where you know, inside of one of these vats, one of these containers, I, know, I assume you can see my mouse kind of circling over the container on the left, there's an object, let's say it is a, the auction that I mentioned, and it's got a reference to an object on another machine, and that reference is remote. Now, in many systems, you could do what are called synchronous calls. Well, sorry, I'll skip that. In our system, I've got a remote reference. I send a message, and I immediately get a promise for the answer that will eventually come back to me five seconds later or 10 seconds later or five milliseconds later or whatever it is. And so in this case, when I you know, send a message, um, oops, uh, you know, the message goes across and I will immediately end up having a promise for the answer, which I can now operate on. So if it's send a deposit, I get a promise for the, for the, for the receipt and or for, you know, for, for the, 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 the deposit slip. And I will wait for that. And when, it, when it's done, then I can proceed about my business. All of that can happen in the context of, of each of these contracts. So they're all sending messages asynchronously to each other, um, you know, in order to continue communication. 
um, and, and the world, some, some of those um, bats are running on one chain, some of them are running on my private machine, some might be running on my phone. It allows me to have this nice simple model of, of simple processes that are all communicating with each other spread across these different kinds of machines and chains and so forth. Now that, we build that model in JavaScript. The main reason for that is going back to that original vision, the original vision that I posted on the first page. Our goal is to enable cooperation. You know, I'm, let me actually just go all the way back to that because it's really important, is to be able to bring all the ways that people cooperate, all the vibrant world economy, the, you know, all the different kinds of business arrangements, all the collaboration arrangements, and enable moving those online into the decentralized world, right? Moving those into a world where they execute with high integrity, where, they, where, where you, can, you can audit what happened, where you can have high assurance of security, high assurance that the transactions executed the way you expected. And cooperate as a result, because you have reduced this risk, you can cooperate safely with many more people. You can cooperate safely in many more ways. You can cooperate safely with total strangers in places you don't know because you have high assurance that the actions they take cannot harm you. And as soon as you can cooperate safely with more people, you tend to get more general cooperation. And we find that that's a better form of world is to have a world in where people are more interested in cooperating with more people more often. And that's the thing that we've been building infrastructure for. Okay, and so the thing is, that means millions of contracts, millions of ways people work together, millions of actions every day, and that means we need millions of programmers to wake up in the morning and instead of building uh, a Facebook add-on or instead of trying to build the next service that has secret data that they can, that they can, that they can um, you know, market and mine and so forth, we want them to easily wake up and build a decentralized application where it runs in a high integrity environment with appropriate customer privacy and that sort of thing. And so that means enabling the millions of programmers to be able to build this stuff. And uh, that means you have to build it in a language they understand. We've been on the JavaScript standards committee for years. Marcus, you know, I've been three or four years. Mark's been there for 12 or 13 driving JavaScript to have security properties that we need to be able to build this stuff. And that all came together in 2018 with all the relevant pieces in the standard such that we were able to build a security kernel so we can build all of this stuff that I'm pointing at here in a secure version of JavaScript. And so the language here is a language that 80% of the programmers on the planet understand. You know, that's something like 18 million programmers. And so we then build in that and then finally, the last thing is, so above this, hello, Brad, above this, we have a library written in JavaScript in this object-oriented programming model to be able to easily talk not about simple objects, but about exchanges and escrows and auctions and payments and new digital assets and, and, and you know, unique media components and all those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a framework in which you can easily build commercial and cooperative applications. And so that's sort of, you know, there's another layer of our stack, but or another one more little layer, which is specific library pieces that we're working on. But that's the basic idea of, of sort of, 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 of um, the stack that Agoric is building. And so we will be, we will be deploying, you know, this Agoric public chain so that it's very easy for people to deploy um, contracts into a public environment, executing with high integrity, where total strangers can come up and participate in, in these markets, participate in these contracts that other people are deploying. But the same technology will enable consortiums to deploy their stuff. So you could have a freight consortium that was managing um, a, um, a chain of custody of packages as Amazon, you know, as, as a truck picks up a package from a train and carries it over to a ship which then goes to another island that gets delivered to your door, all those transitions of who's got responsibility for the package at some point is chain of custody. Being able to do that in a decentralized fashion is a win across the board. Um, the World Economic Forum um, uh, estimated that, that being able to have decentralized chain of custody across a broad range of shippers would uh, increase the world GDP by 5% and increase international trade by 15%. That was, again, more than a couple of months ago. Those numbers may be different now, um, but, but, um, uh, but the numbers in any direction end up being huge if you can pull that sort of stuff off. And so consortium chains, 
private chains, even private companies deploying their own internal networks should use this kind of technology in order to have high integrity execution of their application. So that's a bit of a deep, a bit of a dive into the high levels of the stack. Of course, we can go very deep in any of these layers if, if people want to dig in. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and we have a hand raised, uh, if you don't mind, oh, okay. uh, Jack Mills. Hello, Jack. Hey, Dean, how's it going? Good. So uh, I missed like the first 10 minutes of this thing. Are you guys doing your own chain or DAG or are you bolting on to existing chains or DAGs or perhaps both? I will be specific for you. So we are, uh, so the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so at this level, a lot of the technology is commodity at the machine and consensus level. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes, I think I am. Um, and so, uh, so while we have innovations there, it's not worth our time to spend on it early. So we are using Tendermint. Tendermint is a consensus algorithm for decentralized agreement. I talked about blockchains are all about getting a bunch of computers to agree on stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, the Tendermint uh, al algorithm is, is very well respected at the time. It's the core of the Cosmos blockchain. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I'm just uh, answering for everyone else, giving them context. Oh, okay. So it's the core of several different, both public uh, consortium and private chains. You know, the private infrastructure like Hyperledger is rolling, is is working on a, a Tendermint based engine, et cetera. Um, we're mostly agnostic to that. So we were originally looking at, at, at a different chain than Tendermint. And because of this layer where we can easily straddle across all of these with different, with different um, uh, underlying infrastructures, our overall model is completely agnostic to it. So we will be able to have a Tendermint chain and a grandpa chain and a, and a, and a hot stuff chain. Those are all different agreement algorithms, different consensus algorithms. And it's transparent whether your guard contract is running on one and reaching, and reaching to a contract on the same chain or whether it's reaching across to a contract on another chain. From the point of view of both programming and the users, it's largely transparent. Um, and so we'll be able to migrate across these different infrastructures as we go forward over time. Is this migration under the contract developer or DAP developer control? Can they constrain it and say, I only want it on X or Y or Z or um, so, so the, 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 the simple answer is TBD because we have not, right. we're not implementing that yet, but, right. but semantically all of those are possible. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and the question it's it, the right way to think about it is migration is under the control of governance. It is up to the, the deployment of the contract under what governance is, are you able to upgrade, migrate, change, close, et cetera. And sometimes you will have people that this is my contract, I own it, I'm going to control it. And many contracts will be of the form, it's up to the, it's up to the stakeholders of the contract, whether they want to migrate it or it's up to the chain holders or something like that. So we will have- All right, thanks. We have a lot of hands up. Um, we have, did, did this answer your question, Jack? Do you want to jump in? Oh yeah, I can always bug Dean and Mark later, so. Yes, please, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> All right, Mark. You want to say uh, something? Well, actually, I just wanted to point out, I think there, we have a hand raised. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. It begins uh, T-S-O-L. Yeah, uh, it's Solomon Dorge, but uh, I go by Toma. So uh, I have a quick question. Uh, so I was at the Ethereum uh, hackathon in Denver. And during that weekend, a lot of DeFi applications were hacked because uh, they were sort of hodgepodging, building on top of each other, and sort of this rude Goldberg-esque yeah. issue. And their biggest issue was um, uh, not reaching consensus on which oracles to use. And I'm wondering if I built a DeFi application on top of Agoric, how would the oracle situation work out, or how could you prevent uh, oracle hacks? So the, the, the biggest answer is, you know, one of the things we talk about when we're going just, you know, I'll go one, one level farther in terms of, of, of uh, this, um, the top layer here. Um, you know, when JavaScript first came out, it was this low level language and a few experts could do somewhat cool things on a website. And nowadays, 
Amateurs that are just learning this stuff in their first class can do stuff that's vastly more amazing than experts were able to do 15 years ago because they can grab an existing framework and, and, and components that were built by third party experts that have evolved over time and they can plug them together safely. Um, and the thing is, that's not an accident that happened. There are deliberately built frameworks with design rules and architecture for the components to be able to safely plug together. And so much of when, you know, when we look at Ethereum and we look at, 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 at you know, Ethereum is the first blockchain that really enabled smart contracting. Um, and so it's great and it really opened up a whole, you know, opened up a bunch of these ideas to a whole new bunch of people. But it has, you know, unsurprisingly, some fundamental and insurmountable flaws, the key, key one being its security model. There are two elements you know, where, where security experts on Ethereum writing smart contracts were introducing bug, you know, had contracts with security bugs where they'd lose tens of millions of dollars literally in minutes with no recourse, right? And that's one of those things where if they can't get it right, what chance do we have? And so the security model has two fundamental flaws with it. One is you just can't get it right. So Ethereum as a platform, from my perspective, will dead end in its expressibility. Um, because you just are never going to get a million programmers to be able to succeed at that without 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 losing their shirts. And the other is it doesn't enable easy and safe composition. That ability to do object-oriented, secure, safe composition is a key ingredient to being able to do frameworks. And so that's that's a big part of our design stuff. That is one of the main ways that you don't eliminate that problem, but man, you sure help it a lot. You, you know, but just, just by having sane and coherent ways to plug these things with a sane and coherent framework into which Oracle will, oracles can play. So now instead of having six different ways and five different competitors all coming in these different ways and you don't know how they all fit, instead, here's a framework. It's clear which one you're using. It's clear whether, whether or not you're relying on it. You know, there, there's, there's various ways of managing that. There's two other answers. The next layer up from this is a thing we call, um, oh, I don't have it here, is a thing we call Zoe, which, is, which, which I will just point you at the paper for that, that is a much safer way of composing different contract elements such that they, um, uh, you know, such that they can't, you know, lose their money to each other. And so, uh, and I can go into more of that, but let's answer some more questions, and then I'd be happy to come back to that. All right, next one up, we have Ted. Okay, hi, Dean, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the summary presentation. It's really fun to see where where this has been going. So, so my question is: It's been a long time um, that the idea of, of it's been appealing to me that an economic aspect of these smart contracts is that they could support a lot more complicated kinds of transactions than people can readily handle or or even identify. And I'm thinking of things like contingent contracts or combinatorial auctions for people that ha that want to help in finding some valuable exchange for them among some subset of items that, that, you know, that they have and need to be identified. Now for me, this is for a long time, it's just been hypothetical. So my question to you is now from your experience with, with looking and working on these, these contracts, have you found any examples or gotten any ideas of the potential value of these more complex possible exchanges that without smart contracts are, are kind of like the proverbial $20 bill that's left on the sidewalk <laughs> that no one knows how to pick Absolutely. up? Yes, the, the, this is the beginning of something where I had an hour that I, hour and a half that I went through that goes into a bunch of use cases. I will give a, a, a simple example because to me, um, you know, composition is where much of the power is. There's a lot of, you know, what most of the contracts we see are what I would consider sort of toy contracts, not in that they aren't doing real money, but they're, 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 they're sort of, because of this composition problem in Ethereum, they're all little mm -hmm. islands unto themselves with, with some really crappy ad hoc composition that, that, that as Tomo pointed out, um, uh, people are compromising all the time. So I mentioned the chain of custody app. So this is now kind of a consortium app, kind of a public chain app, um, but chain of custody is, you know, as I said, is where, where you know, in the US, um, 90% of the packages travel on the trucks of a company that has 10 trucks or less, which is an astonishing number. You know, all of us sort of think of UPS and FedEx as handling most of us. Like, no, most of them travel on a, on a, on a company that has which means, uh, 10 trucks or less, which means it's a very, it, it's very decentralized. And, you know, and they can't, they have trouble competing with the FedExes of the world because they don't have chain of custody across the delivery of a package from my place 
over a truck to a train to another truck to another train to another truck to the final destination. Mm -hmm. And so decentralized chain of custody is really hard and would be really valuable to these people eventually. That's clearly a smart contract because you wouldn't trust you know, random diesel trucking company to host centralized information on what all the bill of ladings are and who has what shipments and all that sort of stuff. But if you actually did do chain of custody, now suddenly, you know, right now these shippers, I'm a, I'm a, I've got 15 people in my company with 10 trucks or 20 people or whatever, and I get paid 120 days after I complete the job. From a small business point of view, that's just crazy. It's really painful. It's really low margin. It's really risky for all these things that are the lifeblood of making an economy work, right? And if I can tie that chain of custody to a, to a, a, a infrastructure that will do payday, not payday loans, but uh, accounts receivables loans, now I've got a high integrity, indelible proof that I did my part of a multi-step shipment process. Right, I did my part of a 30 day delivery process or whatever it is, but I'm done and I would like to, like to get paid now instead of 120 days from now. Because mm -hmm. I have that indelible evidence, I could have that automatically tied to this loan infrastructure that is making an accounts receivables loan against the fact that I'm now owed certain money against a shipment contract. And so now I could have much, much smoother, smoother cash flow. Literally, I could get, you know, 60% of it the same day, 80% of it five days later, that sort of thing. Um, so that now all of these decentralized shippers are much better economic position, much cheaper costs, much lower risks, all those kinds of things. Tied to that, now we can have the insurance holder changing each time. We can have um, uh, uh, you know, IOT, um, you know, sensors on the thing that if it's refrigerated, we know exactly if it ever gets its temperature compromised and we know who was responsible and they immediately get dinged. All those things could automate, you know, could be relatively small applications, but they all compose together economically in order to substantially improve pretty much everyone's life in that overall, in that overall ecosystem. Is no, that that's kind a of great ability? example. Thanks. Thank you. Very, very nice. Okay. Next one up, we have Mike. Hi, uh, great Thank talk. You. Real interested in your platform here. So, now I was curious, are you guys doing any like atomic cross chain transactions, <laughs> uh, decentralized exchange? Right, right. So, um, so the answer is we, we, we know all those people. Um, but one of the key things that we observe is there are a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that people look at funky weird crypto. Um, but, and they do all this, you know, peg zone stuff and all, all these kinds of crazy things. But if they did just a little bit more, then you'd be able to do a secure message in an object oriented sense. So instead of having something that can only just, you know, increase your balance and decrease mine, I want something that will take a deposit message that happens to have an amount. And that is the same kind of commitment of transfer of value. So this IBC, oh, and let me say one more thing and then I'll come to this IBC. Um, and so if they did just a little bit more using a bunch of those techniques, you get the much more general expressiveness of arbitrary message passing between objects. So it turns out that if you then take some of those protocols and atomic swap is one of them, and you just implement it in a naive way in JavaScript up here, and the objects are on different machines, it pretty closely maps to what people manually constructed as cryptographic protocols between those two machines in order to do an atomic swap. Now it's not quite, and in some cases it might be more or less limited, but as a practical matter, you've pretty much solved the same problem as long as your infrastructure is handling the correct delivery of, of these messages securely in this asynchronous, the asynchronous thing. And so what that means is a lot of these things that people are doing weird custom crypto stuff for, they just shouldn't be because the, the level of what it takes to make one of those secure is incredibly hard. Whereas the, the atomic swap uh, uh, equivalent code to do this is, you know, 40 lines of JavaScript, something like that, easily accessible to, to 20 million programmers, right? And just a lot more accessible. Now, there are a couple of key things you can't do that way. Zero knowledge stuff is just freaking black magic. Um, you know, so, so all the zero knowledge innovation is totally off the charts and awesome. Um, and you also can't do what's called um, a hash commit, where a second price auction, I'm a sealed bid auction rather, I want to place a bid and now I'm committed to that bid, but I didn't want to disclose it to everyone or they can cheat. 
that you can't do in an O system because the people running these machines, they're going to see your message, even if you're trying to be secret about it, right? And so that's something you have to do with a clever, you know, send the hash in, send the cryptographic hash in, everyone agrees on the hash, and then you send in your bids, and then you prove all these things. So, um, so but, but one more item on this. So IBC here is inter-blockchain communication protocol down here. And that is exactly an abstraction of interchain, um, you know, verifying each other's light clients and pegging and all that sort of stuff to provide TCP style communication between chains. On top of that is where we do our distributed object stuff. So these two things together let us do a lot of those kinds of things as simple object protocols rather than custom crypto. Now, you do need atomic swap magic in order to be able to interop with very low level chains like Bitcoin and, and, and Zcash because they can't do enough computation to support this level of interoperation. But between, you know, Cosmos zones or Cosmos and, 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 and Polkadot or any, no, any of a number of different chains, doing IBC directly is just a lot more impressive. All right. Uh, I still have the hands up of Jack. Ted and Mike, but you already asked questions. Is there a new one from you? Like a hand that ju just popped up or is it- Oh, I don't know how to take the hand down. Go. So you can look, another button next to raise Okay, hand good. Lower. Then, uh, then uh, is there any other? Okay, is there any other question? Otherwise, uh, I'm gonna ask one. <laughs> <laughs> I also have one more thing I wanted to add on the- um, Any question? The use case. Yeah. So the one more thing I wanted to add on the use case thing about the, the freight chain of custody is there's a lot of people that were starting out doing this stuff where you know, blockchain and you have to say, oh, you have to say it with, with you know, jazz hands, right? blockchain, add blockchain, and it'll magically be better, right? Um, uh, that's part of why I do this preliminary thing of what the hell do we actually mean and what's the actual value? Um, but they would do private chains. So, you know, wait, if it's a private chain, then you're administrating it all, which means you can compromise it. So what the hell? This buys me nothing, right? Well, it turns out if you do private chains, but your different machines are deployed in data centers where there's no person that can slip into any more than one of the data centers. Now you've got two data centers that are going to vote against the compromised data center. So you're still better off inside of a company. But in that use case of, of you know, the, uh, the, the consortium use case of freight, that's one where there's a consortium of people that are actually working on this stuff that includes a bunch of these freight companies that want to solve this problem, but they aren't doing the financial one. There, you know, there's finance people that are doing financial ones. And so being able to do this kind of IBC and interchain communication is crucial to the future online economy, because even if you've got all these consortium chains, by being able to have them bridge to each other, now you can have these comp compositional distributed use cases of, you know, I deliver, my, I deliver my package and now I get paid on this other chain. So back to you, Allison. Okay, very cool. Well, uh, it's going to be back to you in just a second. Um, so uh, I would love for you to maybe like provide uh, a little bit more context on uh, like historically. First of all, um, maybe you could say a few words about the, the Goric papers. I like I remember like when there was a time and suddenly like everyone Zuko and everyone started sharing them like crazy on Twitter, and it was it was uh -huh. I think uh, I think. Uh, uh, quite quite an interesting time, uh, I think, for, for Mark and a few others. But then also not only the history, but also in an ideal world, uh, you know, where do you see this kind of like projected? What kind of economy uh, can, can we expect in, let, let's say, 15 years if everything goes well? So like, I'm like, what's the, um, I'm like, what's the trajectory that, uh, that, that we're on if everything goes well? Thank uh -huh, you. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, so the, the uh, let, me, let me see if I can find something here that, that I think you would enjoy. <laughs> Uh, yes, I have another slide and a different presentation that is worth, that, is, that, that I think is worth looking at here. Okay. If I have a, of course, is the Agoric chain then, um, is that based on Tendermint Cosmos with a PBFT or? Yes, yeah, so it's using, Tenderman Cosmos underneath, and then everything else is, is built above it, but we'll be able to substitute that out later. I love it. That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> but also with a future project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Mark and I first worked together at Xerox Park a long time ago. He was already thinking about distributed objects and, and that sort of stuff. And we worked together in a project at, 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 at 
at, uh, at Xerox to do exactly that, secure distributed objects in a secure distributed programming language that nobody's ever heard of and no one could type, right? Um, but but it, it helped us develop a lot of these asynchronous programming ideas. Um, concurrent with that, he was working with Drexler on the Agoric Open Systems papers that really were the first uh, characterization of software agents both creating and participating in markets. And it's got a paper on incentive called incentive engineering that as we now know it is called uh, mechanism design, but it, it, it designed a uh, processor scheduler that was economically sound that is what we're planning to use or something very close to it in our actual chain scheduler. So there was a lot of real big firsts in those papers that evolved out of their work with some amount of, you know, contribution from the rest of us doing this overall secure distributed stuff. Um, we then went to Xanadu where we were both working on hypertext and, and Amex, American Information Exchange, was a, um, so, so well, we were all cypherpunks at the time. We went to Xanadu, um, that's right, I, I skipped at Xanadu. At Xanadu, we continued that, that, that async model and that's where we invented promises, which if you programmed in JavaScript or now um, in Rust, in C Sharp, in Java, all those things have this notion of async promises that came from Markov and I's work back, uh, um, back at Xerox and then later at Xanadu. Um, and that's where Amix was a sister company to Xanadu that was across the parking lot and was working on this first production smart contract. In the Agoric blog, we, we recently, uh, Chip Morningstar uh, recently joined Agorix. He was the chief engineer at Amex, at American Information Exchange, and he just uh, 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 published a blog that talks a little bit about Amex and the, and, and the design ideas they learned from the Amex experience. Amex was American Information Exchange. You know, one of the bad characterizations was, you know, eBay for um, uh, contracting agreements. Um, and, uh, but of course, this was in 1989. So not only did it predate eBay and predate blockchain, it predated the internet, right? So, um, so all of this stuff was very early days here. Um, and so, and the key thing is that was 1989. That was before the term smart contract was articulated. One of the big realization, you know, one of the big points out of this is, is Amex was really thought of with all the different ways that, you know, Phil Salen, the, the creator of these, these ideas, you know, really thought about it being this coordination point with the following properties of, of orchestrating cooperation between third parties and all this sort of stuff. Nick Zabo, you know, pulled those ideas out, mixed them together, you know, had many of similar ideas and characterized it and put a name on it, right? There's something very important about finding a pattern that's actually really powerful and new and unique and putting a name on it so it can get its own legs. And so the name, the coining of the term smart contract, I think some of that, you know, certainly there were lots of discussions at that, as I said, back at the Foresight days in, the, in, 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 in that time period. But, um, but that's, that's sort of what the early founding of this stuff was. We then started a company called Agorix that incorporated our distributed system stuff. A lot of the-, the, the I, I'm sorry, I just, I just feel like I need to jump in on the, that characterization yeah. of uh, Nick Zabo's contributions were uh, tremendous. Uh, Fair and, enough, yes, 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 um, absolutely. And, and in many ways led to the modern world of blockchains. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of innovation that comes from Nick Zabo that was really original with Nick Zabo. Yep, yep, and fair enough. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 absolutely. Um, then we started Agorix with an S that was inspired by the Agoric papers. And that was very specifically having markets in computational resources was one of the key elements of both the Agoric Open Systems Papers and the Agoric effort that we did, where Agoric was a company that was doing large scale B2B systems, but one of the projects was a big research project with Sun Labs, where we were building a framework for smart contracts and composition. Um, and we built a bunch of very cool stuff and there's some papers about that. And there were demos that ran around the labs and it inspired various um, you know, things that, that actually did go out to production, um, including all the way, some of the ideas went all the way into OAuth of all things. Um, uh, Markham then uh, started working on the e-language and that was carried forward at a company called Electric Communities. And that was one of the first efforts to take these very sort of advanced async communication and, and you know, um, ordered messaging between independent concurrent actors and all this sort of stuff and map it into a language that was accessible to many more people. And this was mostly a, a computational model formulation of it in terms of these simple event loops that made it much more accessible. It was still a new language, which 
um, you know, most languages never see the light of, 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 of more than 20 users, right? Um, but, uh, and then I will go forward in that upper line where, where Mark then took those ideas, went, to, went to, to, to Google and started the Kaha project, which was the first um, from, from scratch open source project at Google to bring those ideas into JavaScript, to take advantage of all that insight and architecture and technology that had been developed in you know, Agoric and Joule, Agoric and Joule and E and so forth, and realize them inside of a language that lots of other people were already using. And, um, and that drove much of the security of modern JavaScript. You can find quotes from Brendan Eich about that sort of stuff. So, so we would be in much worse place if Markham had not championed all these ideas into JavaScript over the last 12 years. Um, and, you know, you can see sort of concurrently all of the key concepts happening in the crypto space. So Markham uh, released, uh, where is the paper? Uh, oh, maybe it's not on here. There was a paper that Markham published in, uh, you and, and a couple of other people, Bill Tola and Tom, about uh, financial, uh, financial cryptography. Yeah, uh, distributed electronic rights in JavaScript was uh, 2013. Uh, and that, that showed how to bring all of this uh, securely into JavaScript in a straightforward manner and, and really made all of our work on JavaScript security pay off. Right. Uh, a lot of the um, uh, really important uh, explanations of composable smart contracts uh, in uh, the E language, the, the paper on that that really kind of um, explained it to the world was uh, 2000. Uh, that was financial cryptography uh, that was, um, I mean, published in the financial yeah, cryptography. The details are on our site. Yeah. YouTube is on site. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now we'll go to the future. Go to the future, um, which I'll just show this. Show. Uh, I will do this and go here. Back to this pretty slide. There we go. Okay. So um, you know, what does the future look like? There's a lot of crypto systems out there. A lot of chains out there. Our goal, we're building, we want to deploy and build a new economy online, right? So, so it's not just something where you're going to deploy a contract, but you're going to deploy a contract in an ecosystem that makes sense, that has reasonable incentives, that, you know, that, 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 that actually is a, is a, is a, you know, um, uh, uh, a sensible extension of, of a real economy into the online decentralized, online decentralized space. That's, that's Agoric's goal. Uh, and, you know, and that's got to happen. And whether it's us or someone else, but that's got to happen is it's not a separate economy. It's not going to replace the current economy. It's going to be a big innovation that a bunch of stuff uh, uh, moves into. And, um, and so that's what we're working towards. Um, uh, at some point that, you know, the IBC is just rolling out. There's a hackathon about it next month. And so people are starting to look at how do they stitch together all of the existing chains so they can collaborate with each other. But the ability to safely build components across a large number of, of developers remains a, sort of the holy grail that people are looking for. And we have a lot of the technology that will, that will enable that. And it's something that, you know, people know we're, we're operating mostly in the open. There's a lot of people in all these existing chains, you know, from Vitalik to Zuko to, you know, the, all of the Cosmos team to put people at Polkadot and what have you. And, um, uh, and, and they're looking for our technology to be able to address some of these things. So once that's out there, we expect to gradually start to enable lots of other developers to build this stuff for real customers. And that's the goal. And, you know, at what point do you start moving, um, you know, application, at some point you end up with applications where the customers don't know or care that it's a blockchain behind the scenes. It's just making it safer for them. Oh, that's fantastic. I love the slide. Um, uh, um, okay. I think especially for the newbies, that's like really good context. Um, and, you know, because, you know, you, you did have the feeling that like, you know, a few years ago, a bunch of people just entered the space and were like, oh yeah, we just invented that like yesterday. And uh, so I think it's, it's really nice kind of like to see uh, where it's coming from and then it gives us a better uh, understanding it's of where we may be headed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Well, we're now over time. Um, and... Uh, I cannot thank you enough for this really, really good interaction. I really loved it. You are a very, I mean, people tell me that I speak fast, but you're very engaging and fast. So uh, I think it, when you publish the video, I encourage some people to like rewind and like take it slow. This was amazing. Get in, get in line um, on the fast talking thing. I love it. <laughs>
I love it. I'm, yeah. I'm very much in, in the same boat. Okay, I, I'm hoping, what do people think? I really, really loved it. A thumbs up. I think that it was really amazing. Kind of yeah, like very thanks, quick intro. Thanks, and Allison, for organizing. I'm, yeah, this uh, was great. Sorry, also, really good questions asked. I'm very happy that we had such a, like, you know, technically uh, kind of like literate uh, kind of like uh, community here to ask really good questions. So thank you to all of you. Um, I will now let you go to work on uh, 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 on your demo for tomorrow. But thank you so, so much for joining. <laughs> I will see many of you tomorrow morning. We have Robin Hansen here oh, at wow. 9 a.m. on deliberate exposure. So that would be a controversial one. Oh, uh, mm. And then in the evening, we have Creon Levitt uh, here on uh, kind of like uh, positives that may come out of COVID-19 and he's been kind of compiling a lot of things that have been, uh, have been said in the salons over the past few weeks because he's attended every single one of them. <laughs> Let's see if I can talk faster than Dean. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and he will say a little bit about that tomorrow. So I'm super, super excited for that. And um, both uh, of the talks should be fantastic. I encourage you all to come. And um, with I, I, uh, I just ado, realized the big negative that's going to come out of COVID-19 or 19 when, when we, tr if we cure it it's going to cause the re-election of the president. So it's going to be a very high price to pay, but that's what we're going to have to do. Sorry. Oh, well, that's an interesting Oh, sure, end on a downer, to... Brad. What a Oh, sorry, down, yeah, sorry. No, well, they're, they're smarter than we take, than you take them for, that's all I, that's, <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, you're right, that can was I ask a downer. One, uh, can, can, can I ask, kittens and puppies. Can I ask two quick say, questions? Kittens and puppies, yes. Yes, Sean, Sean go ahead. Oh, Sean wants to yeah, ask yeah. two quick questions. All right. First, what's the what's the maturity level of uh, of this stuff, and what uh, and what's the open source? What's the source status? Open. Um, so everything we're doing is open source. Uh, maturity yeah. level, it's still in progress. You know, you saw that four layer stack. The stuff yeah. at the bottom that is Tenderman consensus is deployed on multiple multi billion dollar networks. Um, the, you know, the stuff above that JavaScript engine is running in production. You know, the one we're going to use is running in, you know, running on Maytag washers and Whirlpool dryers and whatnot, right? Um, so that's, that's production. As we go up, it's, it's more and more, you know, so we are in the process of putting together an alpha of the top layer of the stack, and we expect that API to change. The JavaScript layer, yeah, it's a lot more stable, that sort of stuff. IBC what? is just out for... Uh, you know, that's the protocol for interoperation that, uh, uh, that release one is out. Um, the relayer was just, was just published three weeks ago and there's a hackathon for chains to start, um, doing interoperability testing and interoperability, you know, example implementation, uh, starting April 20th. What, so, what kind of performance are we talking about? Um, the, yeah, you know, that, the, the, you, you, no one knows yet, right? But, of course. But, you know, oh, okay, uh, okay. I mean, it sort of, it sort of depends on, a, it depends on too many factors. The answer yep. is it can move billions of dollars a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might need big transactions for it, but you can trust it to do it correctly. <laughs> Thank you. That's good enough. Billions of dollars per second is good enough for That's us right. for That's now. Right. Um, I, um, I encourage you to please send me your slides because then I will add the slides to where I add all speaker slides on the schedule. Um, and uh, then people can kind of follow up and, and add some more. I mean, like, I love the, the kind of like historical slide, but if you have other cool slides that you want to like uh, send us out in the package, then please do so. For now, I cannot thank you enough. Um, thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, thanks for taking time. This was like a really uh, kind of like quick magic wand waved. And now we're all a little bit, uh, a little bit smarter. Um, all right, um, great. I hope you have a lovely night and I'll see many of you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you later.